answered it thoroughly, it appeared. So thank you very much, Mike. Referring to what a question. Mike had, uh, has uh, motorized our 20-inch Dobsonian telescope. Oh, uh, yeah. And he, uh, there was a customer who has bought one and was wanting to put setting circles on it so he would be able to use it as a push to and get it in the right spot. Mike gave him a lot of information that I didn't have because Mike had measured it and figured it out uh, by measuring it. So that was a very helpful uh, piece of information that I have now uh, written down and have it in my documentation sheet as well. Again, thank you very much, Mike, for that. Um, if you haven't started solar view and you need to start, as I said, the sun catcher, fantastic way to watch that turn or to, to watch the solar viewing, uh, to watch sunspots. There's a bunch. We counted on Friday night 22 sunspots, and that was at low power. There's a bunch of sunspots on the surface of the sun right now, and going to be some. As we go through the next year and a half to two years, we're going to be going to solar maximum. The sun goes through an 11-year cycle of whole bunch of sunspots. Not very many are nose and no sunspots. So we went for a year and a half or two years without very many sunspots or no sun, sunspots at all. Now we're coming out of solar minimum, working our way up to solar maximum. We'll have tons and tons and tons of sunspots, and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they'll taper off and go back down to none, and that's the solar cycle. It's an 11-year progression of uh, sunspots. So awesome to watch sunspots. What I like, like about sunspots is it changes. So sunspots get bigger, they grow, they change shape. Uh, you'll be watching a spot and it'll look sort of funny. You can see some, just something going on. And then you notice, well, that's getting a, black, a, sun, a sunspot. And then it grows and grows and grows. And suddenly you can see the sunspot through your solar safe filter. These go right here, okay? Right here is where this <coughs> kind of sun, solar safe filter goes. It does not go here with the sun pushing down through the telescope. If you do that, you're going to instantly burn a hole through the uh, uh, filter material and that unfiltered sunlight that is super high charged, it might as well be a laser, is going to be a long distance finger poke. And here comes some video from Scott Roberts proving what's going to happen to your eyeball. So it's a beautiful sunny day and uh, we have uh, uh, you know, our refractor out and I've got my eclipse glasses on and I've got my safe solar filter. Of course the eclipse is not here yet, but um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you some things about uh, solar filter safety. Uh, the filters that we use is the uh, Thousand Oaks material. It is uh, rated to the highest uh, ISO standards. Um, and uh, ind actually independently tested by us as well. So just to make sure that those standards are met. So if you're going to use a telescope to look at the partial phases, and par the, let me underline partial phases to you, you use eclipse glasses to observe the sun in partial phases. When it's uh, in total, if you're gonna be on the path of totality, you can take the glasses off and only during that time which is going to be roughly two minutes this time on August 21st, only during that time can you directly look up at where the sun is because it's completely blocked out. You'll see the corona, you'll see you know, lots of really cool effects that will they'll leave you speechless. But during all the partial phases, you have to have safe solar filtration. So how do you do it uh, properly? Uh, let me show you. First off, let's show you what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do is put on eclipse glasses and look through the telescope that's unfiltered. Uh, and I'll show you exactly why here. We're gonna point the telescope directly at the sun. And right now, we have sunlight coming right through the eyepiece. Um, you know, can turn that up a little bit. If you use solar glasses and look right at the filter material, you see it's already burning it's burning a hole right through the solar filter material. That is how powerful a telescope is. So this is definitely something you don't want to do. You can now see that there is a hole through there and that could be your eye. So this is what can happen if you think that you can use eclipse glasses to look through unfiltered telescopes or binoculars. If you do that, 
uh, the sun's energy is going to burn right through the filter and burn right into your eye. So if you're going to use a telescope or a pair of binoculars to watch the partial phases of a total eclipse or just to observe the sun to look for sunspots or something like that, uh, make sure that you are using an over-the-lens solar filter that has the uh, proper ISO safety rating and all of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this filter on. It's, uh, you can see how snugly it's fitting here. This is not about to come off, uh, uh, but uh, you know, if you have a loose fitting filter, use tape. Do anything that you can to make sure that the filter is not going to come off. Um, and then the, the other thing is too, is that uh, finder scopes, um, uh, optical finder scopes are like little telescopes and they need to be filtered as well. In this case, I just have a red dot finder. There is no um, magnifying power to it, so I'm not going to use it to sight the sun in. The way I'm going to sight in the sun is literally as I'm, I'm going to look down at the shadow and align the scope up so I'm getting the smallest shadow possible of the telescope as it's hitting the ground. And now I can safely look at the sun in comfort and look at sunspots and if we have partial phases going on in the eclipse, I'll see them all. And if that doesn't horrify you thinking about what that's going to do to your Mark 1R or your Mark 1L eyeball, it horrifies me to think about actually having that happen to an eyeball. Um, it would not be fun. Um, just, just, mm, boy. Question or comment from Osmosis007. Scott, I'm guessing, is going as a space pirate for Halloween this year. Uh, you know, I am 80. You know, with that, uh, with those burned solar glasses on, yeah. And here's another one. I never joke with the sun in our area. The sun is like above our heads a few centimeters. Tariq, as I said, who lives in the UAE, yes. Um, you know, I have a, a friend that lived here getting his uh, doctorate in electrical engineering, uh, works for uh, outside of Baghdad, and I see some of the temperatures there, and I'm just like, ah, oof. And, uh, yeah, I know it's a dry heat, but so is an oven, and it cooks meat. So uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just that kind of heat is just brutal. So um, I can imagine being that, you know, being in that kind of play, part of the world where that sun is just so intense. Uh, Egon, <laughs> yikes, Scott. Yes, indeed. It's, you know, and he actually did that because... Uh, Experienced observers actually called him and asked him, is it okay if I do this? He's like, no. But they just, you know, even though they're experienced, they were smart enough, and this is a key thing that, that it goes for me, it goes from everybody. You have to be smart enough to know what you don't know. And at some point, when you start playing with your vision, um, you would get a... Um, put your eye out. Tariq, if you came here, it would be much more reddish too. Absolutely, but you know, uh, sunscreen is a SPF 50. I put it on all the time. Yeah. I wasn't going to be out, so I was out for an hour and a half, uh, maybe that long picking. I wasn't worried about my arms. However, uh, my son, I always wear a cap. Uh, I umpire youth baseball. I'm always out there with a cap. Or the caps I wear might have the mesh in the back, but that's filtered sunlight. It you doesn't need burn, but you know, it doesn't hurt. It's just got a little bit more sun right here I than think it's used to. To visit so. Tariq, you might need an SPF 2000. Or um, you can buy some of these Habit Brand shirts that have, this is actually a SPF 40 uh, sunscreen shirt. Buy a long sleeve shirt and uh, wear a straw cap and uh uh, you know, you're still going to get your skin. Still going to have to get used to the reflective light. I went light swimming at the lake off. for like a, two hours and didn't get any sun at all with no sunscreen. Well, uh, that must be some good genetics coming out in you, Paul, because uh, I most assuredly. <laughs> can, you know, this is. I mean, I'm out every weekend. That's with sunscreen, right? So, I'm not worried about my arms, but I didn't think about tops of my ears. In my head, so sunburn a little bit, not bad. Egon burned a hole in his shirt once. Uh, with a uh, I have 
I have uh, done that. I was going to do some solar viewing, and I was using the, the finder scope to line it up and uh, took the lens cap off, and somebody, we were at a, a public outreach. Somebody asked me a question, and I was using a, a, a schmidt Cassegrain 8-inch telescope, and there's a hole in the back, and I just always just plug it with an old black film canister, and I was sitting there, I started going, it smells like burning plastic. I turned around, and I didn't, didn't really couldn't find it, and then I saw a sun projected on the ground, and went, uh-oh, and it just melted that black film canister just gone to bits um mm -hmm. and yeah i can imagine you know being able to set your clothes on fire or something like that and not realize it. if it was a baggy shirt like this it's you know not touching your skin and and uh yeah i don't want that so anyway how the sun they catch are works. that we've been asked here <coughs> about the shirts what's the question what paul look at the screen does Explore sell the 50 FPS shirts? We do not, Egon. Um, we have a link to them in our Amazon carousel. You know, I thought about buying some because I have a source. And, in fact, I, Tyler and I are getting ready to order some that we're going to take and have Explore Scientific it's logos in the put carousel. on them. Uh, yeah, but they're not Explore. We're going to get the Explore Scientific logo right here, I think. We might get them on the pocket. We'll go see what the what the embroiderer says we can do. Uh, I prefer but, Tommy Bahama oh, myself. These are, I, I like these shirts. They're vent in the back, you know, variety pack colors. Uh, the problem is, Egon, that, um, you know, carrying inventory of every size and every color gets to be pretty expensive, and then they don't move, and then, you know, uh, they get grabbed for somebody needs a shirt for a broadcast, and they don't go back, and they don't come out of inventory, and it just becomes... Uh, um, you it's know, okay. Um, yeah. So Tommy Bahama, but, but, you start, but you, know you what? start doing the Tommy if, Bahama shirts, and I'll start wearing them. If uh, uh, if you're interested in getting one of these shirts with an Explore Scientific logo, Fresh. we'll have a better idea of cost. Um, probably middle of next week or something like that would be my guess. So. Finishing up about the solar filters. How does see this how work? he just ignores how me? How do you make, sir? Said you just ignore me. How did I ignore you? I told you, Tommy Bahama. Get the Tommy Bahama shirts. Tammy Bahami. Go and buy I'll, them. Go buy I'll wear them. them. Talk Robin into it. So, yeah. these comes with four of these triangular pieces right here. If I have four pieces of double-sided tape, you'll pull one side of the, of the cover off, stick it down, put your... Square there, put your triangle there, square. Put your triangle Make there, sure triangle that there, thing triangle is there. On tight. And, then, and then you're going to cut these to fit. And how I would do it is take the dew shield and press it down really hard so it makes a little mark. And then cut inside of that mark, right? Because you can always cut more off, but if you get it too loose and it blows off, you don't want to use it because we can sell you more of these things, no problem, but you want to proceed slowly. You want this to be a tight fit like in the video Scott had. He had to work to get that, that on there to get it to stay on. Why? Because you don't want somebody to walk by and just touch and it come off. You wind don't want blows. a big old gust of wind to blow it off. you got to have this thing on tight all the time so it won't come off. I have a question coming up here. Hey, there's Dr. Daniel Barth. Hey. During my solar outreach program, uh, go get a mic. Mic him up, please. Uh, During my solar outreach programs, okay. I've had six he to can, ten we can hear solar him. telescopes. I can, I can get Okay. Close. Yeah, we're <laughs> you're, you're, you're greenish today. And constantly announce that these telescopes are special and make the people repeat it back to me. So I know that they know. Mike, that's, I do the same thing. I give, the first thing I do is say, you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you want to look at the sun? No, don't do it unless they seem like they really, really, really know what they're doing. And even then, uh, Daniel, you've probably, this is Dr. Daniel Barth. Hi, guys. Um, uh, he has the uh, uh, social media blast for uh, uh, How Do You Know? How Do You Know? And he's talking about, uh, planetary Nebula. Planetary Nebula uh, today. today. So um, I always you, tell folks to put their hand over the eyepiece, and if you go, 
out or the lights really intense, yeah, yeah. then don't put your face then, there. But if you see people, <laughs> but, but we'll be out doing it, and there'll be you know people after people, person after person do it. And then somebody will come by and they'll go, no, I don't want to. And I'm, why not? It's, it's fine. It's perfect. No, I'm not going to look at the sun. And although they can see 10 people, ten before, people them, before them, yeah, and 10 people after them say no, they still won't do it. Uh, Osmosis 007. Since I can never catch the astro astrophotography segments, is there an astrophoto astro photography camera? Uh, thank you for reading. I, I've lost my it's ability. For come on, Ken. Cell phone. Um, I will tell you, you can use your cell phone for astrophotography. However, two caveats here. Step uh, in a little bit more. Sure. Uh, two caveats. First of all, um, things that are really bright and impressive, like the moon, work best. You need to have the latest model uh, cell phone to have it sensitive enough to detect this. And uh, a lot of people try this handheld. I want it's to hard. Take a picture. It's, it's hard, hard, but it's doable. Um, I teach my students to do it. Uh, but if you've got a tracking system and uh, Explore sells a amount to affix your camera to mm -hmm. your eyepiece mm -hmm. and you can attach it. And if you've got a tracking mount, you know, you can go ahead, but it's going to be like 30 years ago because you can't stack frames. You just got to get one long there's, track to there's actually, it. you know, there's actually programs out there you can download on like an iPhone, I know, okay. uh, that you can stack in your iPhone that will actually do it in the iPhone. Technology uh, changes so quickly. It, it does. It's because, because you know, when you, that's what's happening. You know, I can take a four or five second exposure with my iPhone. Right. And it's not blurry or anything because... It's actually taking a whole bunch of series of pictures and stacking them up. Right. And the ones that are out of alignment, it just rejects and they're gone. Right. Now, our friend Mike Wiesner, uh, he takes pictures of galaxies and nebula all the time with a smartphone. There's this yeah. weekend. Yeah, I saw that. You posted that on the Facebook. Yeah, I, I, hey, Paul, zoom in here. I don't know if you can zoom I, in here and no. see this. You can put it down there on top of the sun catcher. Right there? Mm, yeah. Not using the camera on the cell phone, just a camera that you uses to bring Bluetooth to send the images the, to, to your, your phone. Uh, we do not. It's not in focus. Up and left. There you go. There you go. Back up just a touch. Yeah, I'll. I'll there it I'll, is. I'll give Kent a copy of that to post. Yeah. And this is. Uh, this is a single exposure, handheld, no guiding. And uh, no processing. It's nice and bright. Did you handheld this at the eyepiece? Handheld, handheld at the yeah. eyepiece. And how and, many uh, how many did you have to shoot to get this? About eight. Yeah. Okay. And I, I shot eight, and I kept you know adjusting the parameters. Right. Uh, you go to pro mode, so you can make the focus manual, so you can control it. And you have to keep tweaking and trying. And then when you're done for the evening, the next morning I went through and you know. Uh, I ripped him down and said, "This is the best one." Yeah. But I think I think so, it turned out so quite os nice. osmosis. Oh, it's beautiful and blows up well. Hi, so Paul. I have an answer to this question: the Good. Sony A7 III and up, and the A7 II will send using their program on your phone. They will send the image to your phone. However, you only get the JPEG. You do not, you don't get, get, the raw. The you don't get the raw or the TIFF or whatever. I know Nikons and cameras, Nikon and Canons will do the same thing. Right. But, but they again, only send the JPEG. They're sending the low, low quality JPEG. They're not sending the high res one. Um, I don't know of any, you know, I don't do a lot. Right now, I'm not doing any astrophotography. That'd be a question for Tyler. Uh, go find Tyler. <laughs> Please. Just telling him what to do now. Go find now. Tyler real quick. Who's. And we'll ask Dr. Tyler Barth, that question because he'll know. Kent Mark's slave so, Dr. Already. Barth <laughs> works for the university and, and a right good one, too, sir. Then he works at the University of Arkansas, Department of Education. He teaches the teaching students how to teach astronomy. And I'll tell you what, Dr. Barth is full of brilliant ideas. Uh, Planetary nebula are made up of planetary gears. Ha 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 ha, Mike Overacker. Some people won't get that one. I that don't get it. That one's funny. I don't get it at all. Uh, Shake the bush, boss. Yeah. Shake the bush. Planetary gears. 
like in a transmission or a internal power transmission system, okay. planetary gears, they're a gear that's inside of another gear. Come on, join the club, buddy. I'm, what I'm what right is? Here. So, um, where'd the question go? The question is, there you go. Ah, not using a camera on the cell phone, just a camera that uses Bluetooth to send images to your phone. So do you know of astro cameras that, that, are there any astro cameras that have Bluetooth that sends the pictures to your phone? No. I don't the, think I, so. I, They're all wired connections, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And the reason is? Because it's a wired connection. No, but why, Dr. Ah, D? Well, <laughs> the, uh, Join us in the, the wired connection He's leaving now. a lot faster. And you stable. Have to, and more Get stable. Out, Tyler. There are DSLRs <laughs> with Bluetooth, and there are DSLRs with uh, options where they will, it's not Bluetooth, it's a different kind of wireless transmission, and they will send a picture to whatever off, you know, camera storage you want to. But if you're using a DSLR, then you can just take the little uh, card, the memory card, right. and transfer it anywhere. If you're using, if you're talking about a straight astrophotography camera like the CCD cameras that are just designed for astrophotography, they're really designed to hardwire port into right. a computer and that's about it. Because there's so much data. I mean, you're talking about 20, 30, 40 megabytes of pictures sometimes. You know, phones today are so spectacular that I wouldn't doubt that there would be some way that you could take that wired connection and get an adapter and yeah. put it right into your phone. You know, Pete, but, uh, uh, okay, thanks for the answer. Thinking I enjoy visual but would like to share some images. I work on cars, another hobby I have, and I have a diagnostic scope that sends to my phone. Neat as heck. Yeah, things like that. Um, I know there's a, um, I've seen like it, Auto parts stores where they plug in the module oh, to do diagnostics, awesome. and you have the app. Those are awesome. I have a a, a bore scope, or you know, a, a little camera on, a, on with a 30 foot lead that you can run down into stuff and right. use. When I was when I was doing welding, we checked right. inside of pipes for sugaring on stainless steel. Thing is, with an app, low res. Is, right, low res, low data rate transmission. And they're usually for applications where dropping out a little bit here, there isn't a problem. Isn't a problem. But transmitting an astrophotographical image, uh, yeah. eh, that would ruin the image. So you really, you need some kind of a hard connection. Because yeah. those, if I remember correctly, those aren't packet transmissions like the Internet uses. They are not. Those are stream. FTP. Right. FTP. Yeah. So, there you go. so they just, it's a file and it sends the whole file. Correct. Whereas over the Internet... It's sending the whole design of the internet was by the military was really straightforward and simple. So if this node very got blown out and we're sending a message to this, we're going to break it up in packets from the Pentagon, or this would be the octagon, from the octagon, and we're going to send a message over here to this station. And we're going to send in a bunch of packets, and it's going to go all different directions right. and end up and there, reassemble and then reassemble at yep. the end. And so, for that method of Bluetooth, just doesn't do that. No. And when we send, when the camera sends a file to your hard drive, it just sends that file Correct. with zeros and ones and zeros and ones. Correct. It's not sending packets. No. The whole idea of the internet was so if a nuclear launch message went out. They could figure out what the message was, right? Even if pieces of the of the network dropped out. Yeah, that's correct. All right, so uh, we got to be careful what we say here. So you're getting ready to talk about planetary nebula in an hour. We can't say where or what because we're on Amazon.com. Do we but, have this on our carousel? No, yeah. we don't. Do we have Star Mentor up? Let me see. The new book. It's a brand new book. I don't think. Talk about it because we there can it get. Is. The, there we've it is. got it's it on up. The carousel. Pull the book up. Talk Ooh, about it real got quick. Got it up on the carousel. Paul's giving us to cut it off, but we're going to ignore him for a minute. That's right. Okay, I'm here used we to are, it. folks. Star Mentor. Here, set that on top of that. We've one. been, we've you been. Go. Can't. You're his microphone. I know it. Hang on. We've been talking about this for weeks, folks. This has been uh, more than a year in the writing, and it's been a long process getting out. But I received my copy from the publisher this week, and it's it's all uh, there. Forty plus years. Oh, this is my 45th year in education. So, and most of those teaching astronomy and physics, and I. Put it all into here for you folks. The idea, there's so many people with new equipment that don't know how to use it. They want a mentor. They want somebody to guide them. And there's other people like Kent 
who are really experienced, and people are asking them, teach me, can't teach me, show me the light. Mm -hmm. And for both the people who want to share their knowledge and the people who are uh, isolated, that is, out of the astronomical community, there's not a club in your town, this is for you. There's more than 50 activities here for you, and they're, they ramp up from easy to more difficult. They will teach you how to set up your telescope, how to track, how to find objects, learn the sky, and um, this this book has over a hundred. This has like 180 illustrations, I'm just, I'm just, and uh, many of them are in color, and it's it's just lavishly, lavishly illustrated. So this is it. Just starts at the basics and works your way and through. Works your way up. And works your way up. Yeah. And there's some there's some no. cloudy night projects here. Right there's one. I'm trying not to break the back of the book right off the bat. No, go ahead. That's my handle and pass it around so people can see. So you see that. right there how to use um, modeling clay. Modeling clay to make your own craters. The modeled uh, surface of the moon. Right. So that when you get out with your telescope, you've now got a better idea of what you're looking at. And, and because of the different colors, you can figure out what happened when. That's right. And you can actually start seeing, maybe not knowing the ages, right. but you get the idea of these are younger than those because right. this has ejecta on top of them. And how many times, Ken, have you had people come up to a telescope when you're at an outreach event and say, now what am I looking at? Yeah, the moon. Yeah. Yeah, or and craters. When you bring a little more knowledge to the eyepiece, mm -hmm. you take a lot more value away from it. And uh, this is this is a this is a life's work here, folks. Yeah. This is 40 years of teaching people uh, how to use telescopes, how to do astronomy, and all the basics, all the fundamentals. And it's it's here for you in one volume. I have not read it, but knowing Dr. D and seeing his other offerings, this is worth $31.88 over in the carousel wow. right now. Because uh, the uh, list price is 35, so that's a great deal. Uh oh. Noah, don't tell oh, the don't tell the, the the book owner that we're cutting his deal. No, I, no, no, they, I know. They sell, sell, sell. I, yeah, folks, I'm the author, not the vendor. Right. So whoever is is buying these, <laughs> uh, it's 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 great, and thank you. Uh, but uh, I already sold the book to Springer, so when you buy this and take it out and use it, uh, mostly what you're doing is. Uh, helping me advance the cause of amateur astronomy, right. build my brand, and uh, get more products out there. I'm working on a new book called Begin with Binoculars, yeah. and that's my project for this year. And uh, I'm just, I'm so thrilled with this. This came out. Have you taken out the Tetons? Have I taken out the Teton, new Teton binoculars? No, Probably I have not. not. So no. let's, this is not a self-published book. No, it is not. This is a, a publishing house. Springer Verlag. Springer uh, is a European company based in Germany, and they have offices around the world. And they this is part of the Patrick Moore Practical Astronomy series. For those of you who are familiar with uh, astronomy outreach, Sir Patrick Moore was a he was the British Carl Sagan. I think I can say yeah, that. Yeah. He was a very yes. popular uh, popularizer of science and advocate. What show for did he have? He had a show. I can't. What was his show? It was in the UK for years, yeah, for decades. I can't. Some the later years, it, it came over here for a while before he passed. I remember he had a show. I can't remember what I've seen his shows right. before. So, so Springer I publishes. I propose that if someone buys the book and has seen you on here, they may contact us, and we might be able to set it up to where you can autograph it for them. If They'd have to send it here and we send it back. But yeah, we can as long as, as, long that. as uh, Scott and company are, are good with it, anybody is... It'll cost shipping both ways. Yeah, yeah, basically send it with a self-addressed stamped envelope. But even more. Right? So I can sign it, put it back in the envelope, drop yeah. it in the post for you, and give me some hint about what you'd like. Because I, I have kind of a strange sense of humor. How I would sign a book for Scott or for... Kent might be completely different from how you'd like your sign. <laughs> yes. But uh, I, I would we had be, be happy Mike to sign Mike He's asking that Yeah, exact so that's question. how we could do it. Um, we have them here. Um, if you order one, I, uh, Noah, are those FBA or FBS right now? Those are not sold by us. Okay, not sold by us at all. 
So we would have to. You'd have to send it to us. Yeah, you have to buy it, get it, mail it to us, and then we'll mail it back right. to you. We so can yeah. work yeah. that out. Explore and store here in talk, talk to one of us. Yes. You know. Yes. Since I'm on customer Am service. Since I'm on Amazon, I have to say it this way. Okay. Go to the Amazon. Go to Amazon.com to the Explore Scientific Store on Amazon.com. Click uh, Contact Seller. Send Noah a message, and Noah will uh, tell you how to go about getting Absolutely. the book here and get it back. Because we can't just have a book just appear. No. Yeah, it, you know, it just, we get so much mail in boxes. No. We don't want that. So uh, also, if you do buy it here on Amazon Live, get the book, read the book, come back, and give it a review. Please. That goes for any product you buy here on Amazon Absolutely. That's so important. Live. Reviews so are important. hugely important. Uh, obviously, you know, we're, we, we, we like good reviews. We but can't, you know, but reviews honest reviews. People aren't entirely happy. Helps us improve products. Correct. And helps me as an author improve my product. Education and outreach is my product. And when I hear from people who are using my stuff, and my work and my uh, my activities, and they say, "Oh, Doc, what about this?" And I saw this, and I didn't understand it, or I saw this, and what's the next step? Um, and anyone who has uh, questions reading the book is welcome to contact me. I don't know, is it kosher to give out an email on here? No, Probably. we can't. No, do we it. can't. Uh, so go to the Amazon information bots. for me is actually in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amazon bots are really, really finicky, and they okay. don't care, and so they'll kick people off. We, we, we no, have don't products. Want you, we, don't want you, we, don't we can't want send. Yeah. We can't we send people off of the website no, right. to contact well, us. Let me or give a good else. example. Contact for me is in the book, so you yeah. buy. Let the me book. give a good example. We have. <laughs> it's so weird. We have products that are taken off of Amazon from time to time because they say we are selling pesticides. Yeah. There's so what one? Pesticides? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Telescopes. Oh, I yeah. can't sell it because it's a I've, pesticide. I zapped an ant with a magnifying glass in my day when I was 10 or 11. But Science. Science. Yeah. That's not, I don't know so if that's pesticide. That's mm. why we have to be so careful on yeah. Amazon yes, because... It's the algorithms and don't you, care. They have you, no feelings. No, and no, and it's very nice of them to host us, and yeah. we want to we want to be a, a, a good guest and, and ha, follow yeah. their rules. And you can't argue with an algorithm. Nope. There's no one to talk to. All right, so run over a little bit. I'm glad you came in, so we show you a book. Get the book, read it. You're going to learn something that's going to help you in your outreach. Hundred percent guaranteed. Um, it's well thought out. As I said, he. All the education students at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville take a Dr. Barth class or two learning how to teach astronomy to whatever age group that they're in. I and, train mostly K-8 educators, but okay. occasionally uh, people who teach older kids. Right. So you will learn something and you, you will. will you will up your outreach game. Dr. Barth talked about, you know, building the brand. Look, as amateur astronomers... Our brand is amateur astronomy. It absolutely right? is. And this will help you build the brand of amateur astronomy right there. And I've, I've always said, Kent, and, and you know this is true, the telescope is a party in a box. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you go set up your, your telescope in your driveway, and you're looking at the moon, you're looking at Saturn, you're going to draw a crowd. People what? will literally pull their cars over coming down your street. Is that a telescope? Can mm -hmm. I have a go? And they come up. Will you teach me? What am I looking yeah, at? How yeah, can I see this? Yeah. Is this different? What's the magnitude? So, so Immediately the questions start so, so bubbling out. We had a couple, man and woman, that came down from Springfield. Sure. Close to Springfield. Up close. It doesn't Missouri. matter. Missouri. And uh, they knew the store was here, and their anniversary was Friday, and she wanted to come down and buy her husband. He was Ooh. interested in astronomy, and she wanted to buy a, a telescope and a mountain. What are they going to need? And getting their budget together. And I said, oh, well, you know, hey. If you, we're going to have um, NWA Space, the nonprofit I'm board I'm on with Dr. Barth, we're going to have a uh, an, uh, uh, observing at a bar in uh, downtown Bentonville, Arkansas, and you know you can go eat a, at Wright's Barbecue and come on by. And she's like, Yeah, I th we'll do that. So they went to Crystal, they went to Walmart Museum, and I don't think they went to Crystal Bridges, but then they showed up and uh, looked at the sun. And she was buying it for her husband, right? She is... Look, got set, didn't it? Deep and hard, brother. She was like, 
Oh my gosh, that's the... And we were talking about it, and then the moon came up, and we got the 16-inch knob out and put it on the moon. And she messaged me uh, on Saturday going, okay, that star party you're talking about in Arizona, when is it because we're going to come, right? She was hooked and had, had, had just been, eh, you know, and she, she was sort of interested, but she left there inspired by looking through a couple of telescopes. And we had people literally who were driving down the road. It's in a residential sure. slash bar industrial area. And there are people who would, you see them looking, and they'd go down and park and come walking back. People ride, it's a biker bicycle. Can't call it a biker's bar because it's a bicycler's. Cycler's bar. It's a cycler's bar and restaurant. Really good food. And uh, called the Meteor Cafe. They'd go riding back, and you'd see them pull a U-turn and come back. You know, yep. and it was awesome. It was just absolutely awesome. Yep. We were there until midnight. I'm sure. Pekka night. says hi, by the way. Who does? Pekka. Hey, Pekka, how are you? Here's Pekka. There. Howdy, Kent and Daniel. Howdies. Howdies back at you, Pekka. Uh, you know, for those of you who have not maybe been seen the broadcast before, this is a global audience. Today we've had, I know people from. Uh, Dubai, Dubai, not Dubai, Sweden, UAE. Um, not yeah, not Dubai. UAE, Sweden, uh, all over the United States. I haven't seen anybody I know from anywhere else. But a truly global audience, and this is the cool part about. It. All right, last comment, uh, and then we're going to have to go. Uh, I'm Pekka. Dr. Bar's books immediately. Uh, if he could send them private posts, not company, that way I would skip the unnecessary taxes. Uh, uh, Pekka, we'll talk. We'll talk. We got you, buddy. We'll we'll fix you up. Oh my god! But uh, we'll talk off off the show. And I'm gonna I'm gonna address your other question you emailed me about today on my mm. show later. So that'll mm. be fun. All right. But this, you know what? I'll be I'll be willing to put it out there, hands down. This is going to be the best guide to introductory astronomy you've ever seen. You wanna. People who already own a telescope, and you know the fatigue sets in after, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Here you go. Somebody comes up and says, oh, but I have this telescope, and now my neighbor's 12-year-old kid is asking me to teach him. What do I do? Here you go. Somebody says, oh, we have a club. We want activities to do on our outreach. Here you go. You're a school teacher, and you're planning activities that will engage hands and minds, both in the classroom and out under the dark sky this is I wrote this for you. I wrote it for y'all. We gotta go. Okay, um, we have to get out of here. Um, uh, Osmosis 007. I know I saw a message pop up. We've got to go. No time to answer it because we gotta get the studio reset for Dr. Dita there you go. Uh, to get going here at four o'clock. Uh, so ask next time if you get on, and we will go from there. Everyone, thank you very much for sharing your time with us because it's an honor to see how many. It truly is. How many people are willing to give us their time to participate in How Do You Know and Global Star Party in First Light Chronicles, On the Wing, and Focus Amazon on Live. Astrophotography, and on Amazon Live. We truly appreciate we do. your time uh, because you know what? Our brand is Amateur Astronomy. You're part of our brand. We're part of Amateur Astronomy. Everybody that gets into it helps everybody else. That's right. With that, on behalf of everybody else here at Explore Scientific and Dr. Barth, as well as Paul Newton, the disemboweled voice, excuse me, the disembodied voice. He's not say. disemboweled anymore. And uh, uh, hey, Noah, wave to okay. the camera. Here's what it looked like today. He waved with his right hand today, not his left, and we're going to get out of here. I'm he Ken has Mars. much Bye, more everybody. hair than you. He has much more hair than he you. He does, but I have a lot of hair. I just... Get a burr every three weeks. All right. Bye. Out of here. Bye. Bye.
200 times microscope offers an impressive magnification range of 300 to 1200 times, giving young scientists the tools they need to reveal the hidden details of their world. Outfitted with a range of collection tools, this beginner compound scope has quality optics that consist of a 40 times magnification eyepiece and a rotating turn of three objective lenses with 300, 600, and 1200 times magnification. The set also includes color filters to give specimens extra definition when needed and a projection eyepiece that allows users to trace images or share their findings with multiple viewers at the same time. It also comes with impressive collection tools, prepared blank slides, a shrimp hatchery, and instructions on how to conduct your investigations with the Explore One 1200 times microscope. Scott Roberts and Mike Hatch here from Explore Scientific, and this is Explore Scientific Live. Now, we have something really exciting to show you, uh, a new addition that Explore Scientific's really never had before, and that is observatory domes. Mike, tell them a little bit about the story of Pulsar Observatories. So Pulsar Observatories has been around for quite some time now, uh, mainly out in Europe, and so they've been designing uh, these beautiful observatories. Um, so Gary Walker is the um, owner and founder of Pulsar mm -hmm. Observatories. Uh, Steve Collingswood is the director. And them two together have created these beautiful observatories that uh, are completely compatible with ASCOM. They can run off Bluetooth so you can be fully remote and yeah. uh, really enjoy these well-crafted uh, observatories. Right, and remote observatories are all the rage today as people have the uh, telescopes and the equipment and you know the internet connectivity right. that makes astronomy what it is today, amateur astronomy especially. So uh, these domes are made out of uh, fiberglass. They are CNC engineered. Uh, so you're not gonna find where parts don't quite fit or anything like that. These things are very precision and they just flat out work. And so that's, that's, a, that's the great part about them. Uh, you will find these observatories here at Explore Scientific um, uh, on our website, and you can contact us at 866-252-3811, or you can go to explorescientific.com and chat with us live about them, and we'll get you set up for your particular configuration. National Geographic CF600PM telescope lets you explore the intricate contours of lunar terrain or the brilliant clusters of Pleiades. Use the red dot finder to accurately line up this entry-level scope with the alt-azimuth mount and tripod to begin your journey into the world of amateur astronomy. The 90-degree diagonal mirror assembly makes viewing comfortable and the built-in storage trays keep your two included eyepieces safe and secure. The easy-to-use telescope lets you see clearly with an aperture of 50 millimeter with a 600 millimeter focal length. And the unique Unique carbon fiber styling of the CF600PM gives this scope a modern, rugged edge. Use the included online astronomy software and star map with the National Geographic CF600PM telescope to begin your journey to exploration of the stars. Alpen MagnaView 8x25s offer performance and value for today's sports optics users, demanding a binocular that delivers. Durable and comfortable, the Alpen MagnaView binocular delivers more features with the BAK7 prism and fully coated optics. Waterproof for all weather performance, the MagnaView series is purged with nitrogen, keeping the barrels dirt free and the lenses clear. The compact and armored 8x25 Alpen MagnaView binocular, built to last a lifetime.
Hey everybody, Kent Martz here. It's Thursday, which makes it on the wing Thursday. We're going to be talking about burning products. Sorry we're, sorry, we're running late. Had a few meetings that went long and kept compounding. I'm sure everybody knows exactly how that goes. Noah. So, anyway. We've got to change be... Kent's batteries. Did you hear him? He's starting to drag. I'm going to change batteries binding. here. No, not your microscope. I'm, you were talking, Kent. Well, I know. What batteries and you were started, you, you started saying. Oh. And then. I thought you meant my batteries in my speaker yeah. pack. Yeah. Yeah. That's Westworld. Because, that's because I was trying to get. My, yes, it was. That's because I was trying to get my uh, thoughts together and speak clearly here on the show. Uh, Ivan Salmon, greetings. Thank you, Ivan, for that. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. This is the warm-up show for the Amazon Live broadcast. We'll roll into right nah, to we're just going to go straight into Amazon Live here in just a second, as soon as so, I get the thing done. So we'll be going to Amazon Live. We're not, we're not second, even going to so. break. We're just going to keep trucking. Yeah. So you want me to just go or yeah, fill time? Going. All right. So we're going to talk about the uh, – uh, I keep talking about these every week. These are fantastic binoculars. Price over the carousel or on our website. I can say that until Amazon Live comes up live. Uh, ExploreScientific.com. You can buy these breasts or 6x21 kids specialized binoculars. They're marketed to kids. The interpupillary distance is a little bit narrower. They fit my face. My eyes are not on the sides of my head like Paul's. His, hey. eyes, are, his eyes are over here above his ears almost. So uh, I, but if he you could say these. stuff like that, I can say stuff like where. Oh, right? absolutely. Oh. The, these binoculars are great binoculars. Metal body, glass lenses, have a diopter so you can focus for your left eye and then focus for your right eye. These are real deal binoculars. These are not toys. These are not cheap little give it to kids so they'll go away. These are real binoculars right here. Uh, my suggestion is, and I keep talking this up too, buy a pair for you and buy a pair for your kid or kids, enough for you to use and your kids to use, and you use the same binoculars they use to go out doing bird watching or go out uh, looking for deer or nature walk or uh, do, use them for astronomy. All great uses for these binoculars. Really great multi-use binoculars come with an neck strap. Nice, generous sized neck strap. Has a safety clip clips on both ends, so if you get hung up on something, it's going to pop off and uh, not cause any damage, not hang, hang you up. So a good yeah. safety strap for kids. These are the Bresser Specialized Kids Binoculars. They are 6 by 21, meaning the eyepieces are 6 power, which magnifies everything by a factor of 6, and they have a 21 millimeter objective. Uh, that where the light comes in, the bigger around, the more light comes in. That's what those numbers mean on all binoculars. First number is the magnification. Second number is the diameter of the objective lens. I cannot speak enough about this pair of binoculars right here. I don't These know. Sometimes things, I feel like you have spoken enough. I have spoken about them a lot, and I will continue <laughs> to, to spoken about them. So, uh, speaking? I'm gonna, Should speaking, I say speaking? Speaking. speaking. I like speaking. Spoken, <laughs> spoken, yes. So anyway, let me know when we go to Amazon Live. We're so working I, on it. Give me so a I can quit talking and not say explorescientific.com. Can't say that on Amazon Live because they want us to keep people on their platform. And uh, we do restream uh, this stuff on other platforms as well during the Amazon Live. Ivan says, can you please show some products that I can get in India for my nine-year-old child? Um that's a tough one. That's a tough one because we don't handle India uh, out of the United States. That comes from our uh, European partner, sister company, Bresser. Uh, .de is their website. I'll but say that. these products that you see here and in our carousel are on the Bresser website overseas. Now, right. the so, stock is different. So I don't know how it works on Amazon and know the Amazon guy's gone. I don't know if you can order it off Amazon and pay for shipping to India. You know, it's a small package. Uh, these would ship to India with no trouble. Uh, it's going to be relatively expensive. The shipping would probably be more than the binoculars. But I can't tell you 
um, what products are in India. I've, I'm really sorry about that. I just don't know. Um, I'm not even sure of the dealers we have in India, right. but uh, if you search for, uh, you know, I presume Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, uh, search for uh, Explore Scientific or Bresser dealers in India, you'll come up with somebody that may have inventory on them. And then how I would handle that is look at the inventory we have on our website and what more specifically what Bresser has on their website on bresser.de uh, and then, uh, which they're based in Germany, uh, and then ask the dealer to order you uh, some with their next shipment and procure some that way. I think that would be the way to approach that. All and right, if, Kent. And if we're Bresser... Roll ahead. into Amazon okay, right now. Okay, we're rolling into Amazon right now. So we're going to cut away, cut away for two, just a second. Huh? Go ahead. Three, two. Boom. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amazon live the explore scientific broadcast generally monday through friday at two o'clock central time every day today is on the wing that makes it thursday on or thursday ving. makes it on the wing on where the we ving. on the ving where we talk about <laughs> birding uh, specifically in outdoors and sports and a little bit of astronomy as well we've had a question from uh, ivan salmon who uh, lives in india and he would like for us to talk about products for his nine-year-old child um, that he can get in India. Uh, that presents a challenge. I'm not sure what the Amazon policies are. Uh, Ivan, you could go to Amazon Live and find our stream or go to our uh, Explore Scientific store on Amazon if Live. If on a product in the carousel, right. it should populate with one that can be delivered and in his currency. Right. That I would think Amazon can do that, but I don't know. So right. anyway, um, I'm sorry I cannot help you more, but again, uh, that's probably the route to take what we talked about just a hey, few, Noah, few we seconds ago. Hey, Noah, those little binoculars in the car carousel, no, but I don't know the number. Noah's not over there. Is he not over there? Did he the, leave again? Yep. These should have been in the carousel from the previous week's show. No. Uh, well, we'll get them up when Noah gets back over here. Yeah, I just, anyway, I don't know the ASIN, which to is talk the about Amazon them, number. Yeah, to talk about them uh, real quick, these are the Bresser 6x21 Specialized Kids Binoculars. These are real binoculars. I think it's like thirty two sixty three or some odd price um, over in the carousel today. It's not an odd price. Uh, it's, it's a great just, price. It's just odd numbers. Generally, they're in 99s and 95s. So... This is, a, if I remember, a, a sort of a strange number. Uh, right. Not a typical number, let's say that. Uh, but great priced. These are not toy binoculars, although they're marketed as specialized kids' binoculars. These are not cheap plastic. Um, Galilean, they're hard for kids to use. This is a real pair of binoculars. Very easy to use. Now, the interpupillary distance is the problem for adults. I can use these not quite full. You know, Explain. Full apart. Interpupillary inter distance. distance. IPD. The distance between the center of this pupil and the center of that pupil is your interpupillary distance. It's always measured in millimeters. And uh, binoculars have a same thing. You can measure the distance from the center of that to this. Actually, it's the same thing if you measure from one edge to the other edge. It's the same thing. It tells you how far apart... The pupil, the, the objective lenses, the, the ocular lenses can get, which tells you if you know your inner, inner pupillary distance of your eyes, you can tell whether you're going to be able to use these binoculars or not. Paul's eyes are really wide apart, like almost on the side of his head over here it's by his not ear almost. True. I'm exaggerating just a wee bit. But his eyes are really far apart. And most binoculars he can't use because he can't get both eyes 
uh, to look through the side it should look through. So uh, right. that would be the, the problem with these. If you have wider eyes, you're not going to be able to use these. But kids are going to love these binoculars. Their real binoculars have a focus knob, so you can focus left, right, up, and down. Paul's coming to show you how far apart his eyes are. Let's just scoot over. Look here. Just this alone. We don't even have to do that. Yeah. Look at that. Inch? Nah. Pretty good distance. The largest ones I have. I don't, there isn't anything bigger. Yeah. So if I do this, there's yeah. wide as it can go. And, he's, and his pupils don't work. <laughs> it's funny to watch his eyes because he gets it on his left eye, and his right eye is going like this, trying to find the hole because it knows it should be there somewhere. Yeah. So. Yeah, it didn't work at all. Doesn't work at all. But it works. Yeah. Works on your left eye, works on your right eye, but doesn't work on both your eyes. So he faces issues with these binoculars. I don't face issues. I have a face with no issues. See, so, I, I use them with my glasses on. Uh-oh. I know. It's fine. Kent uses, he wants these things popped out. Yeah, and I don't use my glasses. Because he doesn't use his glasses. I use my glasses. See, I use my glasses for reading. My glasses is only for reading. Well, and if, I, so, if I use my glasses... Can you get those in your eyes? Just like barely. Yeah. Do, you, do you see one circle or a sort of really I tight see, figure eight? I see that uh, deal you see on the, you see the detective the, shows in yeah, the where 70s. They use, so instead of being like your mind sees there's a circle, you see this sort of two circles pushed together. It's yeah. annoying. It needs to be like that much wider. Yeah. But... But if you do have problems with that, and you pull back like this, it actually does help me to uh, see better. Yeah. By pulling these out. Cool. Because it, it forces my eyes to converge. It gives more. you a little bit more room to converge. But it also makes this not cover as much of... Mm -hmm. You don't get the same don't field get of view. Much, well, yeah, I don't get as much light. The exit pupil is getting smaller. Yeah. Right. Ah! Pick up the down there that you knocked off. You want this? Yes. You want this? Yes, put it back over there where you got it. You don't want it? No, put it back over there. Thank you. So, we'll talk about these fine binoculars in a minute. Or in 30 minutes, something like that. Okay. So, the rest are 6 by 21 binoculars. Talk about those numbers on binoculars. You always <laughs> see these numbers. 6, a number, X, a number. The first number always means the power of the eyepiece. So, these have 6 power magnification. Makes things look 6 times closer than it really is. Or, it's like you would say if you moved to six times closer, same thing. 21 tells you that the objective diameter is 21 millimeters. Obviously, this is a nice compact small pair of binoculars built for kids. So, Paul, we're going to, I'm going to talk about the Purple Martin sort of interspersed, and we're going to show you a video here after about three Do pair of binoculars. So, we're going to be talking about purple, show you a new video of Purple Martins I took over the weekend but of uh, a bird that don't run it yet. We That's should have a, had a pictures. In North Why didn't America we have pictures? That lives uh, in. Where's the pictures? There's only one video. It's all I sent you. But, I didn't take any still pictures. Didn't have any but, time to get them ready. So just the video. And if you want to try and find some pictures of Purple Martins and use them, you can. It's so easy. the purple martin is a beautiful bird. Very I don't know uh, why it's so hard. Lives in colonies. You can put up a purple martin house and have a flock of purple martins, or go for years with no purple martins. Once they find it, they'll come back year after year. Sometimes it takes a long time for them to find one. I'm going to be putting one up this fall, uh, where I'm building a house, and hopefully I will attract some purple martins. They are so very cool. They're very Beautiful bird. They are purple irid iridescent. We'll talk more about them here in just a minute. First, we're going to finish up by talking about the National Geographic 8 by 42 binoculars. This is a great selling pair of binoculars on Amazon. They have a 4.5, 4.8 rating. Get really good reviews by people. They're very uh, inexpensive. They're not... Um, going to not set you back a whole bunch. You can find them over in the carousel today uh, and uh, you'll be able to pick up a pair for yourself. Uh, they're not waterproof. Uh, they're water resistant, but they're not waterproof. They are not purged, so that's one thing that makes them a little bit less expensive. They have twist-up eye cups. They pass the twist test. They don't 
twist real easy, which means they're assembled very well and the design of the connection bridge is really rugged. Has a diopter right here. And as you can see, right here it says those two numbers, eight by 42. That's right, it's eight power, right? So eight power magnification. I got and bit. 42 millimeters right here of objective uh, diameter. Brings in much more light than the 21 by uh, 6 by 21s. Uh, but as you get bigger binoculars and better coatings, the price goes up. Uh, these are a, a fabulous pair of National Geographic uh, 8 by 42 binoculars. A really common size of binocular for birders uh, is the 8 by 42 uh, six by 38. There's all sorts of different sizes, but uh, not a massive amount of, of 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 magnification. One thing that birders, a lot of birders, want is really close focus binoculars. These binoculars are not extremely close focus. I can focus almost on the camera, but 10 feet away, but not quite. Great pair of binoculars for you. Pick these up. Start your burning adventure with a pair of binoculars from National Geographic right here. We make these. They're National Geographic branded. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, these would be a fantastic piece uh, to start your burning career. Something else that you might want to think about is over in the carousel on Amazon.com, you're going to see a burning book over there. It is a burning the book? National Geographic a field Guide to North American Birds. It's a great book. I have two of them. One uh, is uh, at my house. One is in the trailer I used to go camping. Uh, additionally, I need to get one for my office because I use them in all three places. And invariably, I'll have it at the office and need it at home, then taking it home. And then I want to look up a bird, and it'll be at home where I can't look it up. And the National Geographic Field Guide to North American birds. <coughs> uh, Paul, I think is that's why I was going to ask you to get. Hey, Noah, uh, the 6 by 21s uh, Bresser Specialized Kids uh, is not in the carousel. Can you get that over there? Maybe? That would be awesome. It's not listed on the website. Yeah, so don't know. But it's a, it's a 6 by 21 kids. Uh, it's those red and yellow ones, right? All right, so Twist up eye cups, simple to use, standard binocular, comes with a strap and a carrying case. I just haven't put them on. All right, so moving along. Going to talk about the Alpen Wings, excuse me, Magnaview. 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 Alpen Magnaview 8x25. Now, this is a very compact pair of binoculars designed that way, as you can see right here fits into your pocket. Not a problem on this a Habit Brand fishing shirt, which by the way is also in the carousel. I really love these shirts, have a vented back. They're very comfortable, very flexible. Just to like these shirts a lot. Just Wear them to all the, the time. right of the white paper, you can set them down and people can see them in the close-up. Say again? Just to the right of your white paper, oh, okay. you can set them down and people can see a close up. So I'll pull them out of my pocket. See, you can carry these in the pocket. You've got them with you all the time. Nice and compact. That's by design. Here we go. We'll put them right here. Left or right, I mean. Go right. There you go. There we go. Look. So yeah. these are. There we go. Uh, uh, there we go. These are Alpen Wings. Tells you right here. 8 by 25. So we know that means you have an eight power objective uh, uh, ocular lens, so eight power magnification eyepieces, and 32, uh, excuse me, 25 millimeters of objective power. Nice, comfortable rubberized coating. They uh, are fully purged and waterproof, so there's no moisture inside of them. They're filled with, I believe it's nitrogen. It's either going to be nitrogen or argon, so that there's no moisture inside. Uh, nitrogen and argon are both inert uh, gases that do not hold moisture, so once you pull, force all the air out, that takes all the moisture with it. And then they get sealed up, making them waterproof, and in, in addition, they're also fog-proof, so if the temperature gets right, that they cool down, 
and start pulling moisture out of the air. Think about um, when you take a, a can of soda or a glass of tea or some wa cold water outside on a hot summer evening and moisture starts forming, the same thing will happen. If there's moisture inside of them, that moisture will start sticking to the glass surfaces, fogging up on the inside, uh, rendering them useless. Won't happen with any of the upper level um, Alpen binoculars. So let's talk the about the view. Uh, yeah, MagnaView and on up are waterproof, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you said wings a minute ago. These are MagnaViews. Yeah, I said wings and then changed it to MagnaView. So, yep. So, all right, okay. talking about, you got a picture of a Purple Martin? Got a picture of a Purple let's, Martin. Let's, let's fly one up on the screen, shall we? <laughs> ah, there we go. There's a picture. Not no, yet. it's not there yet. Oh, he's getting queued up. So, wow. the Purple Martin. Purple Martin. You know, if you put up a purple, a purple Martin house, you can buy these, probably find them. Should have said, uh, Noah, find a purple Martin house, would you? And put it up over in the carousel. Purple Martin houses are like installing an apartment complex for purple Martins. Um, in the eastern United States, the glossy blue males and browner females uh, peer out from the entrances and chirp from the rooftops all summer long. In the west, Martins mainly still nest the old-fashioned way, in woodpecker holes. Uh, it's the it's North America's largest swallow. Uh, they perform acrobatic aerial maneuvers s to snap up flying insects, and at the end of the breeding season, they gather in large flocks and make their way to South America, where they spend the winter, and then return north to uh, uh, Mexico, uh, the uh, eastern two thirds of the United States, and then up into the middle Canadian provinces. They also have a branch that goes up the west coast, a uh, narrow strip along the west coast, and they are spectacular birds. My grandmother had a purple martin house, and she would set out under the purple martin house and literally talk to the birds, and they would just chatter away back at her, and they'd fly around. I think they loved her because she attracted mosquitoes and flies and stuff and she became a, a buffet attraction for them. Uh, but it was pretty cool. She could sit there, walk up to the Purple Martin house, they didn't care. But one of us grandkids or my parents walk up there, they would take off and fly around in this big old giant cloud. She probably had a, I don't know, 20 apartment or 30 apartment, you know, each individual cavity in this Purple Martin house. And they would just fly in these giant clouds around, just chirping a whole different chirp. Uh, would back away and they'd all land again and go back to talking to Grandma Margie. It was so awesome. I don't know of any pictures of that. My dad has, uh, we estimate, half a million pictures, quarter of a million to half a million photos uh, that take forever to go through them. There's probably a picture of that somewhere. One of these days I may have to uh, get all those indexed and scanned and digitized so we can, you know, enjoy them. Right now they're in shoe boxes and cigar boxes filling up about three quarters of a standard closet. So anyway, Purple Martin, you can see right there. Uh, so what's, it's actually, I've got one more for you. Oh, there are actually purple, indeed. Got oh, one more for you, okay. They're iridescent. You got one? Yeah, I got another one for you. They're an iridescent purple. Wait, uh, that's... With brown, black wings and tail. Purple Martin, but what is that? Uh, that's Ricky Martin. Oh. Purple sorry. Martin and... Uh, uh, Danny DeVito's. Don't. Where'd he not, go? Not gonna go there. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and show the video. Why not? Well, okay. So here's a video I took in Mountain View, Arkansas, where I was camping over the weekend. We were walking back from the 4th of July parade and uh, <laughs> saw these in a parking lot uh, next to a bank and walked up and they took off because, you know, they thought I was too close and I get video of them circling around and just chattering. Can you hear them, Paul? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so we'll let it run its course. And I had another video when they came back in and landed. I didn't send that one. But you get the idea. They'll sweep in and 
all of them land in, in mass and hover a little bit and fly off and then come back. I was just a little too close. They weren't going to land. But, um, you know, that is probably four, eight, twelve, probably a 36 unit apartment house, something like that. It needed some repairs. Some of the front doors were gone. But um, I did not see any house sparrows uh, had uh, moved into the apartment complex. Uh, I, Dad would take down Grandma Margie's. Uh, birdhouse every winter, clean them out, or apartment house every winter, clean them out, get them ready. And then uh, when we'd go up on weekends, uh, Dad would discourage uh, house sparrows, which are an invasive species in the United States, he would discourage them with a BB gun, indeed. And once the Purple Martins came, he, he really worked hard to try and keep the, the sparrows away until the Purple Martins had filled up all the houses, and then that pretty well solved the problem for the season. But let's talk about, they're very colonial, uh, with dozens of martins nesting in the same spot. They feed in open areas, especially near water. In the east, they uh, are almost exclusively, as we said, in nest boxes. In the west, they, they tend to uh, roost in natural cavities. And a lot of times, you know, my grandma, and you see it all the time, people will report the first scout purple martin was spotted at their purple martin house. And Grandma Margie wrote down the date of the first purple martin she saw for years and years and years and years. Uh, the first arriving individuals are not checking out the area to make sure it's safe for the rest of the group. They're simply older Marty, Martins returning to the area where they nested before. Uh, so the scouts are not really scouts, they're just the first ones coming back going, hey, we want to get there. Uh, Martins return north each uh, spring to breed and for their first time come back for several weeks later. Uh, the earlier return of older individuals is a common occurrence in species of migrating birds, the older birds migrate first. Interesting, Native Americans hung up empty gourds for the purple martins uh, long before the Europeans arrived in North America. Uh, so in the eastern United States, purple martins are almost exclusively uh, breed in birdhouses. Uh, so, you know, if you're in the east, eastern two-thirds of the United States, and you have an open area, there's a purple martin in a gourd. If you have an open area, uh, you can put up a purple martin house or you can get these gourds and hang them up and drill the correct size hole. The hole has to be the right size. If it's too big, other birds can get in. There's also a purple martin hole that's like a half moon uh, that the purple martins can squeeze through, but uh, house sparrows struggle to get through that hole. So there's things you can do to uh, help the purple martins uh, have breeding opportunities and keep the house sparrows out of the apartment complex. All right. Migration and breeding range, as I've said, is the eastern two-thirds of the United States, extending up into the middle provinces, sort of a swoop up into the middle provinces of Canada. And there is a loop that comes out of Mexico and goes up the western coast of the United States up until Oregon and Washington. Uh, when they migrate, they migrate through Central America and spread out into the interior of South America. That, folks, is the Purple Martin. I want you to start thinking about, you know, uh, starting a life list. I've started a life list. I, I need to get that up to date with some birds I've seen. And heck, just share it with you. I've seen a lot more birds. I just never wrote them down in the time, date, et cetera. So I have started doing that. Uh, I, my graphic just popped up. It says telescope extraordinary. I'm not a telescope. Mm, you know, you might call me a telescoper extraordinaire, maybe. Coin a word. Telescopy? There. Telescoper. Telescopy. Uh, like a crappie, but a telescopy. Okay, so back to the Alpen. 8x25s would be a fantastic pair to carry with you if you're out in the woods hiking or whatever. Uh, you can carry them along if you're doing other activities, spot a bird. You can whip them out and go eyeball that bird, try and memorize what it looks like, and then use the National Geographic Field Guide to North American Birds. <laughs> First D's of the show. Ooh, boy, we also have a chat function going on right now. If you're on Amazon Live, you can chat us up. If you're on the stream, you can chat us up as well. Uh, if you have a question, thought, comment, whatever, 
about any of our products or that we're showing today or uh, anything else related to what we do, glad to help you out with that. So moving along, moving up in quality just a little bit, these are the wings, 8 by 34 binoculars, come in this nice keeper case, a really nice open bridge design right here. Remember the numbers, 8 by 34, yes, you're right. What does the 8 mean? Yep, 8 power eyepieces, 34 millimeter objective lenses, pulling in a whole lot of light. Really easy to get a hold of these. We got a question, John Dallas, my dad always enjoyed his Martin house. Absolutely, John. Um, you know, uh, I've got a large open area that I'm going to put up a number of Martin houses, going to put them up this fall, you know, uh, after the migration, because I don't think it's any worth putting up now. And hopefully uh, some will happen through in the spring and I will establish my own colony of purple house, purple Martin houses. There was a guy in the, uh, the town of Bentonville, he sold the house, I think he may actually not be living any longer. And at one point, I think he had 200 Purple Martin apartments, and every one of them was full of Purple Martins. And it was astounding to see the cloud of Purple Martins that uh, he drew every spring. And uh, he got to be, I worked for the newspapers for my, most of my career, and uh, he would call in and report the first Purple Martin sighting, and it would be something we'd mention in the newspaper uh, that uh, Sandra... Uh, Ricky Sanderlund. Martin sighting. His wife was the county clerk. Can't remember his first name. Anyway, he would uh, call in and we would announce that. No, it wasn't Ricky Martin. It was <laughs> Purple Martin. So, yeah, if if you've never seen it, you know, it's a very cool sight. Uh, very relaxing to sit there and just watch them fly around. And, and uh, they're doing us a great service because... They're eating mosquitoes and other flying things. That's why they're so acrobatic. I Interesting fact. I go ahead. Tried to find a purple Ricky Martin, but uh, I couldn't. That would be a Ricky Purple Martin. He doesn't wear purple. Huh? There you go. Weird. You think? You know all these pictures of this dude. Did I find he's, one? He's wearing the, a black. He's, he's probably purple. pretty stylish in his blacks and whites. Be my guess. <sighs> So anyway, to branch out. it is Ooh, uh, late. interesting. Uh, lo the Purple oh, Martins often him. feed. There's, there's Ricky Martin with somebody in a purple that's, suit behind him. That's his kid. There we go. So that is a but it's it's still not, Purple Martin. Uh, well, I guess so. So anyway, Purple Martins feed uh, tend to <laughs> be a really high, potentially uh, high f altitude feeder. So often harder to spot when they get up in the sky because they're so high up. Uh, so back to the... the uh, Alpen Wings 8x34. Uh, this is an open bridge design. You can really get your hands down in here and get a hold of them. And boy, they sure pass what I like to call the Scott Roberts Wiggle Test. Twist up eye cups, like all of our you know, high-end binoculars have, have a really nice large focusing knob, a uh, nice smooth diopter focuser, uh, really you know, wider uh, inter, inter pupillary distance. I have to fold these way down to get them to fit. Now, these will not close focus on the camera. They're probably 15, it helps if you 16. Take both eight, caps off and the And still front. focus. I can still see it in focus. Probably 16 Just feet saying. away uh, would be a fine pair uh, to start burning. As we go through these, um, you know, these models get more expensive as we go up because they have better coatings. Um, you Magnesium bodies for one. bodies, things like that. Better prisms in them, all sorts of stuff. Comes with an uh, eyepiece uh, cover that you hook on to the neck strap so you don't lose it. And the uh, objective ends have little uh, rings that go around the end, and there you go. Let's flip out of the way and flip back up. These are the wings, 8 by 34 binoculars from Alpen. Would love to get a comment from somebody else. You know, uh, stories of, you know, Purple Martins, whatever. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, it's really, really nice to sit there. And I, I probably stood there for 15, 20 minutes watching them. It was very hot. It was July the 4th. Uh, you know, it was in the high 90s, there was a nice little wind blowing, and I got in the shade and just stood there and sweated in the shade and watched them. Very worthwhile. So, again, we have chat function up here on Amazon Live. 
Uh, and if you're on the stream, you can chat us up however you can do that. So these are the Shasta Ridge 10x42s, almost said 8x42s. Now we're getting up into some really nice binoculars. A little bit more expensive, but this is a fantastic pair of binoculars. We bought Alpen. to put it down I, in the camera. Alpen had closed, had Late shut now. down and gone out of business uh, in like 2015 or 16 and uh, had shut down, hadn't had any manufacturing there a couple of years before that because uh, Jen was getting on and, you know, there was, they decided to just shut the business down. And uh, we had manufactured a couple of, we uh, had manufactured a couple of pair of binoculars for them. And we saw an opportunity and we ended up buying the brand name and uh, got the website, the URL and brand name. And that's basically it. Um, the last price list, didn't get anything else. And there was no stock, there was no parts or anything left. And so went to re start manufacturing and uh, one of the main factories had closed down and the molds and, and tooling and everything to make the binoculars was gone. So we had to redesign a lot of the uh, binocular of uh, the Alpen Shasta Ridge as one of those. So we retooled, uh, made some manufacturing changes to them. Uh, made a better quality body and increased uh, the coatings, the quality of the coatings and the glass inside of them. Ugh, these Shasta Ridge 10 by 42s are a spectacular pair of binoculars. Really feel good in your hands. Uh, have some knurling on them so you can, uh, you know, feel and get a good grip on them. Twist up eye cups. Same generous focusing knob that uh, all the Alpen models have. A really nice diopter. Uh, that just slides, although it sticks in place pretty well. You have to get it moving, but once it's moving, it'll move easily and it'll stay where you put it. Uh, comes with standard Alpen carrying case, and these have a belt loop thing on the back, so you can actually carry one on your belt loop, keeping them in the protective pouch, which also has a, you know, shoulder strap as well. Now, these binoculars come with, I didn't grab it, this is, it fell off. This pair comes with a really, really nice neck strap. This is neoprene, right? So it's soft, it's pliable, it's stretchy. Back in the old days, my dad's binoculars had a real thick, hard plastic that was just about this big right here. And if you had a t-shirt on, that strap dug into your neck. I uh, loved using binoculars, uh, would go out with dad and, and mom on Sunday drives doing birding and we did a little bit of some walks uh, through the woods, some, you know, uh, north of the town I grew up in and, uh, you know, those would dig into your neck bad. This is not going to dig into your neck at all. This is really going to feel nice. Even if it's just on your neck, you know, long term it's going to feel really nice. On a shoulder, has a nice uh, non-skid backing so it'll stick to your clothing a little bit better and won't just slide off like that hard plastic neck strap did. That's a great benefit uh, uh, to using these binoculars is that neck strap adds a level of comfort and utility use uh, that other binoculars don't have. What time is it, Paul? 2.30. 2.30. We're rolling along pretty good. Maybe a short broadcast today because nah. we were off Monday for the 4th of July holiday. Do they have a 4th of July, Paul, in England? No, they have Boxing Day. Really? They go from July the 3rd to July the 5th? Boxing Day, whenever that may be. No, I asked you if they had a July the 4th in, in, in England, and you said no. If they have Boxing Day. I did not say no, they did not. I said... They have Boxing Day. No, you said day. no, they have Boxing Day. Eh. I uh, love the Whatever. English language and the word play on that. So, Whatever. So to, our, to my British friends, they call it Treason Day. Of course, I have a British friend that moved here. And he moved here calling it Treason Day, but now he calls it Independence Day because he became a U.S. citizen and he saw his air of ways and the independence it gave him. So... Uh, it's really cool. His uh, has a son and daughter, and their daughter, uh, Robin, lost her English accent very quickly, British accent very quickly, United Kingdom accent, uh, 
British accent. Pretty John quickly, Dallas Daniel, says it's very da nice. Daniel to took keep longer. Those mm -hmm. in your truck. Uh, very nice. Keep them in your vehicle or hunting backpack. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, I've used binoculars for for hunting from tree stands, also uh, in pursuit of ducks and geese over in East Arkansas, where. Uh, you know, the Mississippi Flyway. We should uh, go to birds. Claypool's Reservoir. In the wintertime? Like in January? Yeah. No. Claypool doesn't have the birds like they used to, though. Well, there's not. They're all in Texas, and there's not enough of them, really. Well, we, uh, oh, man, this has been, I don't know, 10, what? 12, 14 years ago, maybe. We were over in East Arkansas, and every duck in the world seemed to want to be in the 20-acre flooded field we were in. Yeah. And they were just, it was last day of the season, and they were coming down and just, there were so many ducks, they were landing on the blind. We were, it was a sunken blind. They were landing on the blind and looking at us. Uh, they were ducks landing on top of ducks. And, you know, it, it's an untold number, but literally, Paul, tens, and you've seen this because you grew up in East Arkansas. No, I grew up in the Delta. Well, okay, well, yes, in the Delta, which is part of East Arkansas. No. no Stutt Stuttgart, right? Southern Arkansas. Stutt Stuttgart? Yeah. Yeah, the duck capital of the world. That's right. Well, and, well and it was, is, I guess. it was all different species of ducks, and they were coming down in gigantic clouds, and you know, tens of thousands of ducks, and we just sat there and watch this crazy thing unfold. And yep. it was it was spectacular to it's just sit there and watch this happen, you know. And you see movies of that back in the twenties and thirties. Um it was just awesome. So Well in in the fifties, <sighs> if you remember, uh Claypool Reservoir was a uh on T V live. Yeah. And I mean, they totally faked that. I know it. But it was kind of okay. awesome the way they faked it, though. Hey, you know, there's, there's, you know, um, those wildlife shows are renowned for faking it. So I have my former doctor's son live for three years, Paul, three years with a Wolverine family, I believe it was in Montana. He literally stayed with it all winter long, and it, they came to accept him, and some of the footage he got of these Wolverines was just astounding. But, you know, he spent enough time with them, they were like, eh, okay, he's not gonna hurt us. And they just, he got video of them uh, that's been used in all sorts of documentaries about Wolverines. Truly impressive work, but the dedication to go sit out all winter uh, and all day long and, and follow them around and, um, you know, document something like that. Uh, that's, that's seriously hard work right there. That's a commitment to your craft. So it was most, cool. Do actually, you want to know? Most of the time it was really cold, but what he did was really cool. So you, Do you want to know how they, what they did at Claypool? Sure, if you got that Claypool video, that's cool. I've seen it before. Oh, well, you want the video? Yeah, if you can get it. So while you're getting, I'll talk about these. These are the Alpen Teton 8x42. Paul loves these. He was out filming with our uh, outdoor staff, uh, chief st outdoor staff, uh, Rick White, and uh, who has a show on uh, Wednesday evenings called On the Hunt. And he, uh, uh, it was almost dark, sun had gone down, and uh, Paul tells the story of picking up a pair of these and looking out in the woods. And it was like daylight was up. He was just flabbergasted by how bright these are. That brightness comes from what's called an Abbe prism. It's a different kind of prism designed for better light transmission. Those prisms are inside here, and they flip the light around. So when you look through the binoculars, everything's right side up and left to right correct. Uh, that prism and the special uh, coatings on the lenses really increase the brightness. Now, all of these wings binoculars we've looked at are fully multi-coated. Fully multi-coated means every surface of glass that has light transmission through it is coated with special coatings to increase the contrast and brightness. The first two pairs of, well, the first pair of binoculars, 
and the National Geographic binoculars are uh, fully coated, which means the Bresser ones are not coated at all, I don't think, or mildly coated. The National Geographic are fully coated means it has uh, coatings on the eyeball side and on uh, the optics, the, the front end side, the objective side. So that's called fully coated. If you see fully coated, that means the front surface on the outside of the, tele of the binoculars are coated. If they're fully multi-coated, that means every surface has it. So, Paul, you got it yet? You digging for yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, roll it. All right, let's see. Let's roll, Here we this, go. let's roll this beautiful duck footage. Ducky. Once on 50 there they raise their family and return to winter in the duck country of Arkansas, which extends from... Those are all green heads, it looks like. Mallards. That's a diving duck in the front. Look at all those ducks. That's what it looked like. I mean, there was literally... We can hear the audio. It was literally the, where we were was ducks like that in 20 acres. They were landing, ducks were coming out and just cracking down in the middle of ducks. You can hear the announcement. I like to think of the wild thing, the space of the oh, yeah. as extras in the house that God gave us. I like to think when he created this house of ours, he provided everything actually necessary to live in. Then in order to make the house a more pleasant place in which How long is this video, Paul? He created the wild thing. Two and a half minutes. And I think at this Christmas season, those are divers right there in the front. Those aren't green heads. We humans might take a lesson. See, one just went ducks. under. But although there are thousands of separate families of ducks and ducks of several species all living together, they live in green heads in the back. Arms. Big old mallards. Each big old fat mallards. The of yes, really a lesson. Wait for it. You're going to hear a couple of booms here in just a second. You know, when I first started hunting ducks in Arkansas, more than 50 years ago, the ducks fed on the rice fields in the daytime, going back to the lakes and streams at night to roost. But they were shot at so much on the rice fields. It's a truly astounding sight to see ducks like that. They have completely changed the habit. Now they go to the feeding grounds early in the morning and late in the evening, and that's when they become available to the guns of the hunters. Then they come back to the rest areas in the daytime to rest in peace and quiet. That's a lot of ducks. And now we are pushing to eat. Look at that. Is this the one where they fire off a couple of cannons to simulate gunshots? There we go. Yeah. Right there. Thousands of them up there. They didn't fire off cannons. <laughs> Truly astounding to see that in real life. I've seen it one time with ducks. They did that live. This is live. It's not so pre-recorded and cut back together. Is, this is literally live television in the 50s. It's like one of the first live TVs out in the woods like this. You know, that's, that's potentially hundreds of thousands of dogs. I took a picture once of a uh, flock of snow geese. Yeah and blew it up and measured, you know, on Photoshop, drew, drew a square, and then um, counted how many geese were in that square, and then estimated how many, the size, right? And it was uh, like eight million ducks. It was, I mean, eight million geese. It was astounding how many geese there were in just one picture. So is that the clubhouse or? Yeah. Yeah. So what they did, is they baited the field right they baited the fields before mm -hmm. right probably with either chopped corn or salt one or the other both i think everything they could think of everything they could think of so they're at because the, they wanted those ducks to show up and it's live tv right so, they had to have ducks yeah they had to have ducks so they brought these ducks in here and what they did is they set up dynamite charges okay it's dynamite yeah yeah, absolutely. I said cannons. Mm, same thing. It, no, but different. Much different. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but they, hang on, they set up these dynamite charges, and 
what you hear is boom, 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 boom. And that is the dynamite going off, right? And then you hear these little bitty pops in the background. Peep, 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 peep. Right, because and that's the hunters shooting the gun, so it looks like they're shooting the ducks. Right. So those, if I remember reading correctly, that they had to use the dynamite because they wanted a robust sound that the cameras couldn't pick up. Unless they had really serious booms go off. Well, they were. Well, no, they had to make sure that the ducks actually flew away, yeah. and a couple of shotguns going off with that many ducks. They might not hear it. I mean, they're the, not going to hear the sound, it. Paul. It, you've seen something like that. The sound is just astounding. Every duck out there making oh, its duck sound. Those yeah. ducks, and flapping in water, and yeah, quacking. splashing and. Talking and squeaking. And, yeah. Because a lot of ducks squeak. Here we go. You do that when some mallards are flying by. It's so cool. They fly by. And then they. Wait. And that's when they become available to the guns of the hunters. Then they come back to the rest areas in the daytime to rest and feast. Wait for it. And now we are pushing the The ducks are getting hungry. They're becoming restless. That's falling out of the sky. Well, it's just like deer, you know, or bear. At, at one point, there was like six bear in Arkansas. Wolves. And, uh, wolves have been expatriated. They're not extinct, just killed off here. When you say they're extinct in Arkansas, that's not correct term. Extinct means they don't exist anymore. The term is expatriated. Expa ex expatriated, what? I think. Expatriated, maybe. I think is what it is. Something well, I do like know that, that uh, the National Park Service, about 1920, 19-something 19 around in there, they had an edict to kill off all the wolves because they in were Yellowstone. eating the wildlife. Right. And it turns out that was disastrous for the Yellowstone Basin. Yep. Which is why they reintroduced wolves to try and... because. Nothing to kill off the sick and injured, uh, and the, the eat a few little ones. Uh, the the elk and uh, bison ran rampant, right, and caused oh, yeah. caused all sorts of disease problems and everything else. The wolves are you know take care part of, the of the environment, ecosystem. part of the ecosystem. You know they're the they're they're not the doctors, but they take care of the sick. They, they take care of the sick. <laughs> Very, very good, Paul. Very good. All right, what time is it, Paul? One forty-five or two forty-five. Two forty-five. Okay, so this I, is a great. I can't get enough of that Claypool stuff. Though. If you want 